Hey folks, we're on the road. As you can see, well, we're actually in a garden, but the garden is alongside the road, and we're on our journey out to the Demysticon conference, the very first Demystify Sci live event, hopefully the first of many incredible gatherings. Mm, all right. If, if all goes well, if there's no assassination attempts, <laughs> if, uh, you know, there's no... Uh, no bullets flying or anything. No bombs going off. A week ago, Shiloh was like, never again. There's, Hey, it's, you know, there's always a chance to screw things up for everybody. <laughs> so we're on our way out to Austin, Texas. We're stopping in several towns along the way. Playing a bunch of music. Playing a bunch of music. We played two shows already. They were smashing. Fantastic. Apparently people think that we're a punk band, which is interesting. I would have never thought that. Punk has changed. Yeah. I, I guess we're reminiscent of something. <laughs> yes, some feeling long ago in the world. So that's been really fun. And what we're going to do is have a few solo conversations, which we're going to put out on Thursdays to complement the recordings that we already made before we left for this trip, for the most part, with guests, same as ever. But we thought that we would take the time while we're on the road, as we often do, to reflect on the year and try to draw some new directions with our investigations, with our goals, with this project, and get some feedback from you guys along the way. So today we're tying together a number of conversations we've had with different physicists, different philosophers about the concept of metaphysics. So the assumptions that go into people's physics and into the way that they approach the study of nature and trying to make sense or not make sense of reality, but navigate reality, I assume. And what obligation do we have to making sense, right? Because I think that a lot of this has to do with, do you want to live in a magical world or do you want to live in a world that is of pure physical cause and effect? And so we kind of unpack the different ways in which we see this, the different ways that we see it playing out onto the world. And I think it helped us clarify a lot of these, I don't want to say they're necessarily open questions, they're more just observations that we've made over the course of all of these conversations to see where your metaphysics inevitably lead you, depending on where you start. And what is the role of the interviewer in terms of making sense and in terms of examining the situation? Yeah, absolutely. So I hope you guys enjoy this conversation. Please let us know in the comments. Also... As always, if you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us on Patreon.com. We are supported exclusively by patron donations right now, and that means that we are in a position of complete editorial freedom, and that is how we can make the kind of episodes and have the conversations that you guys really enjoy. Nobody tells us what to do. Yeah. Except for you guys. Except for you guys. <laughs> no. But we trust you. We trust you. And so if you like it, come over to Patreon.com slash DemystifySci and sign up to give us a couple dollars a month through the power of large numbers. We can make sure that we can keep making this podcast for many, many years to come and help it keep getting better and better. Uh, I think this conversation is also going to go out before April 7th and 8th. And so if you have some last minute plans to come to Austin, you can buy tickets to Demysticon up here in the corner. And if you cannot make it to Austin, buy your live stream tickets. You can watch the conversations. You can ask questions. You can participate in the conference from afar. And we really hope to see you there. All right. Enjoy our first solo conversation of the trip, and we'll see you guys next week. The scientific revolution starts now. Wars are fought over metaphysics. But what is metaphysics? Your position is that metaphysics is the water in which you swim when you analyze the world? It's the set of rules by which you tell the stories. Like, okay, if you think about uh, science fiction, science fiction has rules that are very similar to the rules that we have in today's world. Technology operates bound by the laws of physics. And so when you tell a story that's sci-fi, you start from these first principles of like, okay, physics, biology, chemistry, how far can we push that? But if you tell Lord of the Rings you have a really different metaphysics on which that story is based, where the logic of the world, like physics, operates, but the thing that's more important is magic. And it's these mysterious things, and it's people with great powers. And so your metaphysics inside of that story says that magic can be a cause. So the world is not limited to physical cause. In the metaphysics of Lord of the Rings, yeah. Right. 
And so um, what I'm trying to say is that like if you have a a different set for causes, that leads you to a different philosophy in which you relate those causes to the effects. Where if you have a Christian metaphysics, God's in there somewhere. There's like the Holy Trinity is in there somewhere. These are like fundamental causes. And then you're like, okay, when this happened, the Holy Trinity did this and it affected everything downstream of it in these ways. And this is what it tells us about who we are as people and how we should live. But the metaphysics there is the fact that the Holy Trinity is a thing that exists and can act in the world and can be, and cause can be ascribed to it. That's what I think metaphysics is. So metaphysics inherently means that things are caused by non-physical actors? No, you can have a metaphysics that says that only physical actors are possible. That uh, would be all, uh, So it seems like there's two metaphysics possible. There's an, almost an infinite number of metaphysics possible. But only one involves non-physical actors. Or, I mean, sorry, only one involves physical actors and nothing else. I think that's called materialism, right? Like a materialist metaphysics says that the only thing that explains anything is material cause, is materials in motion. Why do they use that same word materialism for people who are really into acquiring material goods? Like new cars and new shoes and stuff. I don't think that these two people are talking to each other. I don't They're think like the two schools. different classrooms. <laughs> yeah. Different schools entirely. Like they've never once spoken to each other, I don't think. That's really frustrating. Yeah, but I mean, God, human knowledge is just a sea of Because people call me a materialist all the time when I'm talking about physics. Yeah. And I'm like, not really. I mean, only because I don't own a lot of cars and shoes. Well, if your physics says that there can only be material things in motion, then it's fair to say that your physics is materialist. But my metaphysics doesn't have to be? No, because then you'd have to be able to say that, like, okay, in my metaphysics, you have to differentiate... Oh. What is it? It's just hurting my brain. Because, like, can, how can I have a material... What do you say? Materialist physics, but I can still have a metaphysical understanding that has non-physical actors. Yeah, you'd have to. I mean, like you would. But have I don't to. believe that they would interact to explain physical phenomenon. So then you remain a physical materialist. If there's no right, like this is the whole thing about dualism. This is why dualism is an intractable philosophical puzzle for the last however long, right? Because like a dualistic material uh, metaphysics would say that there are immaterial things that immaterial uh, entities. Okay. Immaterial. Like God, the hand of God. The hand something. of God. Ah, but. I, but that's what it is, right? No, but I wouldn't try to explain a physical process using the hand of God. I might try to explain a situation someone finds themselves in with the hand of God. But that's a. That's a human social level thing, right? And I would mean it, I would like be very careful to define what I mean by the hand of God. Like, you know, the outcome of the events as you set them in motion, coupled to the chaos of the situation, like we could get into that, but there's certain consequences of certain actions in the human world. And explaining those with materials crashing into each other or pulling on each other isn't really the right avenue for doing that. So, and so I see it as a situational thing. And maybe this is what dualism is about. It's a situational practice where it's like, and I'm not sure how this circles back to metaphysics, but I, I'm just looking at these two processes as different. Like the, phys the application of solving physical questions is one thing. The application of solving social level questions is a totally different set of tools. Yeah, and I think that dualism is a kind of metaphysics. Which comes with its own problems, right? And what I'm describing is deeply dualist. I guess so. If yeah. it's against the non, <laughs> yeah. okay, that makes sense because we had we had these non-dualists on the show, yeah. right? And so they're advocating basically the opposite of that. And so is quantum physics to some extent. Gloves are off. No, yeah. <laughs> just like <laughs> I mean, I th I think so. I'm just trying to think of like does because quantum physics has this weird thing where where there it. It has to be kind of dualistic because there's a place where you go from like quantum physics to regular physics and they're different and you apply different rules. I believe that's at the visual wavelength or something? Around there, sure. But the point is is that like there's a place where 
there is a break. And if there's any place where there's a break from one type of behavior to another type of behavior, you... But the quantum is below that break. So I'm saying like a quantum physicist would never do basic material science problems. You, like using quantum mechanics to solve problems about mesoscale phenomena is kind of pointless for the most part. Yeah, because it's a deeply dualistic worldview because like there's one domain where quantum works but they're both physical domains it's they're both in i don't think that mm. quantum is really physical quantum is mathematical and probabilistic but it is in the it is called physics for some oh, reason i know because they try to explain physical phenomena with non-physical entities of. they try to explain the emergence of physical phenomena Right? Because, like, physical phenomena... From non-physical entities. Yeah. That's, like... it's a, So it must be a dualistic worldview. Because if it was non-dualistic, then... It, okay, so... Sort of like cosmology, too. It's the emergence of the physical from the non-physical, as far as I can tell. They're like, physics didn't really apply in that instant. Other Things were different. Yeah. And so with... I guess... Uh, let me see if I can wrap this quantum physics thing, where I'm like... I think that there is a version of it that is really non-dualistic, which is that everything is made out of fields, and fields at different vibrations produce these different entities that are then physical entities which can act, and so everything is made out of the field. But the field is immaterial. So it's still like this... But excitations that... of the field are material. And so they're basically like just saying that like the field is material when there's energy inside of it. Which is always... God, that sounds so wizardy to me. I mean, that sounds exactly like Lord of the Rings as far as <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> it's so I, far from sci-fi to me. It's so much closer. I don't know if before we started this recording, we were talking about the difference in the metaphysics of Harry Potter versus a sci-fi movie like Blade Runner, where in Blade Runner, you have standard physics, but you have advanced technology using standard physics. But in a fantasy metaphysical paradigm, you would have magic so inexplicable acts of nature and harnessing nature that have no material basis nor is it an interest of the metaphysics i mean it's hard to like argue. there's no one running around the harry potter world being like wait wait, wait, wait we gotta study this this is crazy you just shot a lightning bolt out of the tip of your wand like hold on let's figure out what's going on how did you ionize the air with that wand and like right there's no physical consideration whatsoever it's just pre- like, it's I don't like think that it has to fashion. do that in a story in order for it to be, like, a, a standard paradigm, right? Like, I don't know how much Ray Bradbury spends figuring out the physics of the technology that he comes up with in his sci-fi stories. Like, they can bleed into each other. No, I just think that the there's the premise that it is based on physics. It's just, like... And with something like wizardry, it's based on the harnessing of the force. Like Star Wars has this like weird thing. It's not really physical. It's very spiritual, right? Like you have to be one with it. You have to channel it. You have to, it's not something you can reach out and touch. It's not a place. It's just a vibe. And so that's what makes life, that's what, so that's the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like Star Wars has a metaphysics fundamentally of fantasy and Star Trek is hard sci-fi. To wrap this back, I'm trying to say that quantum physics has a metaphysics of fantasy more than of science fiction. Because there are these impossible paradoxes and things don't have to make sense. And you're told that that's, that's foundational to walking into a quantum physics class. It's like, this won't make sense and that's okay. I, it's like walking to a Harry Potter film. Like you can't get hung up on the fact that the lightning bolts are shooting out of the kid's face. Or I've actually not seen the Harry Potter movies, as you can tell. Maybe I should pick Lord of the Rings. I saw that one a long time ago. And there's, uh, let me think of some magic in Lord of the Rings. I mean, there's people levitating and, no, like, I, I seem to remember some I mean, of that. Gandalf, and Saur, uh, uh, Gandalf and Saruman have uh, a battle that's very magical. And, like, Gandalf, there's not, like, clear magic in the sense of, like, Gandalf waving around a wand all the time. But it's clear that he's a character who's imbued with some kind of supernatural ability to resolve problems. For which consideration of mechanism is just unimportant or irrelevant. Yeah, and I'm trying to say that in quantum physics, I think that they 
are doing their best to come up with something that reads more as hard sci-fi than fantasy. Like, I think that sometimes you read, you read sci-fi and the physics of it just, like, aren't very good. Like, any time that we watch a time travel movie, the time travel movie is ostensibly not fantasy coded. It's coded as sci-fi. Because there's usually a piece of technology. The technology has some kind of... It, like, uses electricity or gas or, like, garbage or something. Yeah, right? like, a time, like a time travel movie where, like, somebody waves a wand. Fantasy. A time travel movie where you go into a time machine that somebody has built and it brings you back into time and there's a mechanistic process by which it does that that somebody mentions that there's like a wormhole. Because the precondition is that they used physical materials to accomplish this feat. Yeah, exactly. But not in in the fantasy world. And that's the weird thing about quantum physics is it it pre-assumes that you don't actually have to use physical materials to construct the mechanism. I think that's an accident. Like I don't, it, it's yeah. fine. I, mean, I think it's I think, an accident. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that anybody was like setting out to dupe themselves or make fantasy. I think they were just like, we don't know how else to explain this. Like they see, you know, it reminds me of that old adage. I don't know who the hell said it, but it was like a sufficiently advanced technology is Inst- indiscernible. Indistinguish- right? Indistinguishable. Indistinguishable. That's the word. Indistinguishable from magic. Sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I think it was either Groucho Marx or Mark Twain. I think. So you could have a piece of technology where it's it's one one of the two. (laughs) One of the Marks. You either have... So you could see something and not be able to explain it and be like, well, it's just magic. Or you could see something and be able to explain it and then it's not magic anymore. Even if it does something that's incredible. Like communicate across thousands of miles through this camera right now. Yeah, exactly. So you could just be like, I have a wizard box, and the wizard box lets me talk to people on the other side of the earth that may or may not exist. So I would say that there's like a half and half that I've come across in terms of quantum physicists. So we've had a lot of conversations about, we, like, we've had a lot of conversations about quantum physics on the show, right? Fundamental physics. Fundamental? <laughs> f- fundamental physics. <laughs> we haven't had any conversations about nuclear uh, physics. Being now. on the roads kind of brought out the redneck in me. <laughs> So there's like half and half, right? Mm-hmm. So half of the physicists that you talk to have a metaphysics where it's like, we're just looking, these equations and so forth are akin to the box that's a technology we don't totally understand yet. It gives us really cool predictions. It, the box can do incredible stuff, the equations of quantum mechanics. We don't really know what they mean yet, but either I'm curious about what they mean or usually it doesn't matter. And then there's a whole other group of quantum physicists who are like, no, no, no. That box does magic, and that's cool. Would you agree? I think that that's a fair... I think that's a fair representation of the landscape here. We have a bird visitor. Yeah, what a beautiful bird. This is a blue jay with some beautiful white speckles on its eyebrows this is now an ornithology podcast except you guys can't see the bird so slightly um, off screen of course you just have to trust Actually, i saw it. this bird this morning he's pretty friendly as long as you're bigger than him <laughs> can you imagine <sighs> okay so so yeah there's two types of quantum physicists there's the quantum physicists that are like yeah we probably are gonna have to figure out like where this is all coming from and then there's the other ones that are like no no no, 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 no. figuring out where it is coming from is stupid because it just is it just is, and our job is to put the most simplified, beautiful, elegant, quantitative description to the isness of it. I mean, I think that there's a lot of philosophy that's wrapped up in it. I think that people are like, we can't possibly know what lies beyond at some level. And so this is a reasonable place to stop. I think that there are other people that really do genuinely believe that thinking of materials beyond the level of the electron is stupid. Like, I think that that's a really real metaphysics. What do you mean? Let's unpack that. Well, just I mean, like I think the, the I would bend these people, is... I have like two bends set up, okay. right? One bend that's like, we don't know. Like, it's, it's, it's a, it's these a, are both it's a technology. These quantum that, physicists? Yeah, so like everybody else is in a different bin well, and started, there's just like a bin of quantum physicists. I start, well, I started off, pick, I started off this conversation picking on quantum physicists a little bit. Right? We decided we were going to talk about metaphysics. And I'm like, and you're, you're like, there's materialists and there's every other kind of metaphysics you can imagine. 
that isn't materialist. And I was trying well, to get... There's, it's, it's also like various like iterations of material, like a little bit of materialism here and there. Like I think that, I don't think that there's like a... It's like human preferences. They're not uh, quantized. It's very analog. This is just a massive distribution of potential metaphysics. Like you can be a materialist in one context and, and have an immaterial, what would you call it, metaphysics in another context. This is the dualist, Supernatural. right? Supernatural. So we started talking about dualism, right? Yeah. Mind-body. And so the dualists, I assume, the opposite of the non-dualists, and we've had these non-dualists on the show circling back. Yeah. So the dualists think that there's materials that do stuff. And then there's all these relational things amongst the materials, which are perhaps best explained by mind, theories of mind and interactions, social interactions, mythology, God knows what else. And so, yeah, that, an interesting, I think what I said was that the quantum, I said at the beginning of this, the quantum physicists are non-dualists. And you were like, well, some of them. Or you, or you kind of you kind of balked at it, but I think what we determined was that some of them are, and some of them aren't. Some of them say that there are materials, but they emerge, right? And we don't, well, both of them say there's materials that emerge at the meso level. But one group says that... Nobody knows no, how that happens. Right, 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 right. Neither, well, group, neither group knows. Yeah, and one group is like, well, it's just a sufficiently advanced technology that we don't really understand it yet, so we don't know what's down there. Some of those people say that we should find out. Some of them say we shouldn't. And then there's this other group who's like, magic happens down there. Yeah. And those are kind of like the more popularizers, from what I can tell, like the Neil deGrasse Tysons, the Michio Kakus, the Brian Greens, the guys with like the huge platforms for the most part, at least when I was growing up. Sure. Uh, seem to be the magic, the magician types. Which makes sense. But it seems like on this show over the last year, we've had more of the curious types who are like, either maybe there's magic or maybe there is an explanation. And a lot of people seem to be looking for the explanation. But a lot of those people seem to be looking for it in terms of quantitative relationships, like Alexander Unsecker, for instance. And even Thad Roberts. And Thad Roberts. Yeah, so... Whereas others, like... And actually, I think Unziker is materially curious a little bit. <laughs> I think that's the way I would identify him because he did this whole lecture series on the elastic ether. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, he was dissatisfied with it or at least wasn't convinced enough by his own reasoning that he was willing to abandon the more, I don't know, I mean, open his valence, magical, quantitative world. I think that his point was that until you have a theory of an elastic ether that is capable of producing the constants of nature that are necessary to make the equations work, you can't, uh, you can't use that as a theory that explains the pieces that you're using to calculate. He's like, we need theories kind that of. actually produce the constants. No, for sure. Because if you can't derive the constant from the, the stuff that's in the theory, then it's, the th then it's not explaining everything that's there. But I remember just that after four of these conversations with him asking him, if he believed that there were actual material actors beneath these equations. And he said, essentially, no. I, I don't, like, if you're listening to this, Alexander, please correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I remember it. That he essentially said there's source code mathematics that itself governs the operations and that that's the bottom of the basement. I know that we have to... Uh represent his perspective here and i don't know if this is correct or if it's just projection but i got the feeling that he was open to being convinced i think so i think so and so that's an, that's a category of people who are used to thinking about things mathematically because that's how everybody thinks about it and that's how physics is done and has been done since newton and probably even before that and who are like open to the idea that somebody could show them something else but they almost don't know how to evaluate an idea that comes in that form. Like I remember when we were talking to Kathy Joseph, she made this really interesting point where she was like, words don't do anything for me. I don't read the words of physics mm, papers. I, remember that, yeah. I read the equations. And I think that's how all physicists operate. They're like, the words don't mean anything. Do the quantities work? And so... Unzucker is like, if you have a physical model and you can parameterize it mathematically and you can show me that the mathematics work, then there's something to talk about there. 
But without having the mathematics for it, it's just kind of like a little fable for them. They're just kind of like, that's nice. Hmm. And so I think that that's where people's metaphysics are kind of, they're on the fence. They're like willing to go either way. But in order for them to decide to jump ship or to change camps, it has to be presented to them in a way that's congruent with all of their expectations for what a theory or an explanation or anything else looks like. So interesting, though, because every equation stands for something. Like, it has a, a linguistic interpretation to it, right? Like, if I show you Hooke's spring equation, it, I mean, if I just write F equals kx on the wall to you, and I just walk away, and you've never, you don't know what any of these things mean, then it's useless. Like, I have to say, look, the force, and then I have to explain that, like, the effort that's, that's expended is going to be proportional to the deformability of this material and how far you deform it. And not just the deformability, but, like, the elastic ability of it, right, to restore itself. Like, it's this complex thing that has to be broken down, right? And, like, sure, it can be reduced to this, like, quantitative relationship, but it, the physical side of that story is so expansive, I just don't know how you can ignore it. I mean, I know that you can ignore it, but I, I don't think that it's proper to leave it out of the concept of physics. I don't think that it's left out of the context of physics. I think that it's just really deeply rooted in being combined with the mathematics. Because if somebody just came to you and was like, hey, the deformability, the force required to uh, move a spring is related to its deformability and the distance of the displacement, they'd probably be like, okay, yeah, maybe. But then if you were like, hey, this is an equation that I'm showing you that works in every single situation and you can always use it to predict what's going to happen when you deform a spring, that's really useful. And so I think that what, you're, what, what it comes down to is the joining of the two being something that people can really sink their teeth into. Like Faraday. The joining of them is beautiful, but it, it's, it's necessary. It's strange when you talk with somebody because there's plenty of relationships that are already mind bending, right? Like any relationship involving the speed of light as a constant or basic wave mechanic, all these basic wave mechanical solutions do that. And you might be like, okay, well, so what does this constant mean? Why is light speed limited? And most people most of these people we've talked to would be like, well, we have to like go examine all these equations to answer that question. All these other equations. And they're like, look, like C is, appears over here and appears over here and appears over here. And they just end up chasing their tails around, I feel like. As opposed to being like, well, why would any other wave be speed limited? Like asking these actual philosophical, is that a philosophical question? Like, let's just look, I feel like it's a scientific question though. Like, let's look at all waves and other materials. What limits their speed? And looking at these these properties like density and stiffness of the material and the lattice arrangement and all of these questions that could allow you to derive what the answer to that question is. But it's almost not an interesting question unless it's a quantitative question to the people who are actually in physics. Which is just bizarre to me. It might be the same sort of difference between basic research and applied research and something like biology. Like there's some guy or some lady who's in a, in a laboratory somewhere just figuring out the, the like peritoneal distance of naked mole rats when given like resveratrol supplements. And there's nothing that that ties to. But somebody somewhere might discover later that there's a functional relationship between those two things and generate some kind of like blockbuster hormonal drug that cures prostate cancer right and so the difference between an idea catching in the world has to do with how it can gear into everything else and so the problem with trying to get people to think about the mediator for the speed of light is that there's no issues with the ways that the equations work. Everything's fine. There's a couple of like problems here and there, and there's some like really nonsensical stuff at the fringes, right? Like if you look at like the age of the universe or the Big Bang or like all of these like, you know, 13 billion year ago things or 13 billion year from now things, 
it's kind of like, okay, well, that's... that's like, does this lead to a technological innovation? I mean, here's the question. I don't know the answer to it. We should look it up or somebody should tell us. But if we had never come up with a molecular theory of heat and we were using this magical fluid of the caloric, would we have been hung up in any technological progress? Because they were pretty knee-deep into thermodynamics at that point, from what I understand. And all of the heat flow equations heat flow equations were congruent, still treating it like a magical fluid. And we treat electricity like a magical fluid today, and we're c- plenty capable of manipulating electricity, or somebody is anyways. Right. And so I kind of think that maybe they wouldn't have been really thrown off that much. Like, maybe um, the fact that it's uh, inexhaustible has changed some designs, right? Because the the idea was that there was some amount of matter inside the cannonball or inside of the cannon. So you weigh the cannon and you're like, okay, this is one ton. Some fraction of this is heat liquid. And when the heat liquid is exhausted, then uh, we no longer have heat. And so we have to build the machine that uses the heat fluid that's inside this cannon uh, only to some degree because it's going to get exhausted. But in reality, you can actually build machines that are, you know, that, that have infinite heat capacity as long as you have friction so the recognition that there is a material mechanism underneath does inform the way that you design things down the road i think so like it it, i think that it takes the uh the the handbrake off of your design parameters that's what i'm saying though that's why i think these are really important topics i think at the end of the day like i really believe that if we were to stop kidding ourselves about the way that electromagnetics operates that it requires a physical explanation that by understanding the physics of that mediator we might be able to manipulate it in completely new and incredible ways we might be able to communicate much faster we might be able to travel much easier at some point i don't know just by manipulating that material if we studied it as a material but as long as we studied it just as this relationship based stuff right yeah if we're just staring at equations i don't know that that's ever going to happen I think that you're right. And I think that figuring out what those things might be is kind of like if you look at somebody like Thomas Gold. He was a guy who wasn't really like top of the game for any one thing, but he was the type of person who was able to see these relationships, write about them, and enter into the lore of the future the ways that we should be thinking about life, the universe, and everything. Long live Thomas Gold. Long live Thomas Gold. Does, do you think that he was influential? I mean, he was friends with Hoyle. He People was, talk about him in... Everybody kind of team. knows his ideas. And I think that he's popular in the frames... Like Sagan or something. I think that he was like a little bit weirder than Sagan, but yeah. But kind very, of in that, w- in that way. Yeah, yeah, like exactly. Lots of little ideas that kind of spread themselves around. He, mimetic. I think that he was mimetically powerful. And so you see the fingerprints of Thomas Gold in stuff like uh, oil abiogenesis, like the origins of life. Um, I think Even Darwin himself did... was kind of like that. Hmm. I mean, I, if, like he has this, you know, he's not trained as a scientist or biologist. He's a theologian. He's seeing everything very relationally. He's looking at, yeah, I, I, who else? Um, I just feel like these outsiders are the only ones that can actually see things for what they are sometimes. There's something about being so up close and studying it that prevents you from actually making these huge breaks. Like the questions that I feel like, uh, I, I'm only throwing our, like us in this, in this boat, not because we're badasses like Darwin or something, but because I don't see other people asking these questions. Like oftentimes we'll hang out with the physicist and we'll ask them questions and they're just like, it's like no one has ever, like, what What are you talking about? That's not a question that we ask here. And that's, like, really interesting to me. Michael Levin kind of does this, too, with biology, right? He's like, well, what are the cells, what are they, what are the cells feeling about this situation? It's like, what? What do you mean? They just got chemicals and stuff. Shut up. But I think that he's going to make incredible progress on regenerative medicine as a result of that. And it requires somebody who devotes themselves to working inside of that space in the context for people to start paying attention. And the, and it's also, I think, an uphill battle, right? Because 
He's making these two-headed worms, and he's working really hard on the projects that are in his laboratory, but I don't know how many people know about him and the rest of the world. Right. And so I don't... For me, it's hard to imagine somebody not knowing Michael Levin, not thinking that his work is incredible and that he's just one of the coolest scientists of the modern day. But I think that there's plenty of people who have no idea who Michael Levin is, even among those who spend a lot of time thinking about science and biology. And so I think that maybe maybe there's somebody like this for physics that we haven't found yet. But I think that it is the path that you have to travel in order to get people to pay attention to you because of the way that knowledge is encoded and disseminated in our society. You have to write books or you have to write papers. You can't really make YouTube videos to spread your ideas around. It's like it's it, people for some I'm reason. I'm not sure about that actually. Pierre's done a product, kind of interesting thing here. <clears throat> Pierre does do something really, really interesting, and he also, but he also writes papers. He, he, wrote, he wrote some, but he seems like in recent years he's been much more devoted to putting it out on YouTube than going through the academic structures. He submits these abstracts all the time. Like, he's documenting himself in the academy along the way. That's what I mean, yeah. Like, it's not just one or the other. It's still very much like, hey, this stuff's going on here. You know, I'm publishing in my own house, but I'm also participating in the society, presenting at the society, talking to people in the society. And I'm like, I just don't know how else it could work. It's, it's a team-building exercise at the end of the day. And so all these people have to come together and they have to be able to come up with proofs of what can be done if you start to think about things like this. And then somebody has to go through and they have to start doing the experiments that show that it's possible, right? Like Levin's got the philosophy and Levin's got the experiments and now Levin has a, like a, a biotech company that he's started and all of it together is aimed at demonstrating that his philosophy leads to real life. Well, yeah, Levin's in a good position because he can generate a technology directly as a result of this. I mean, any paradigm shift is going to be moved on by a technology, for sure. That's the quickest road. If you have a serious theory of gravity or something that's completely revolutionary and you can build a technology to demonstrate manipulation of gravity, everybody's going to fall at your feet. Exactly. But that... It might not be so simple, too. It's not like Darwin's theory allowed people to do incredible things immediately. No, but Darwin's theory seemed like it came... I, you know, I actually don't know much about that fight. Sorry, I have this thing in my eye. Like... I... Yeah. Go ahead. I don't think so. I, I think that there was just a number of people coming up with the same view of nature at the time. I think the religious timeline was at odds with geology and so a lot of people were kind of thinking things had taken a lot longer and if they'd taken a lot longer then slow changes might exhibit themselves in interesting mysterious ways and blah 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 because the only reason i understand that darwin even published at all was because he was about to get scooped by wallace and wallace actually invited him to join him on the paper because he knew through like shared friend circles that darwin had been working on the same thing for like 40 years and he was like Hey, Darwin, uh, you want to get in on this paper because I'm about to scoop your entire life's work. And Darwin was like wrote a quick, uh, after that, they published a paper, and then after that, he wrote a very excerpted brief version of his work, which became the famous Origins of, is that what it's called? Origins, Origins of species. Life. Origins of Species. So he wrote that, which was actually an abridged version of his great, of his bigger work. Interesting, I didn't know that. And I don't know if the bigger one got published, probably. I can't remember how the story ends. My point is that I don't... So that's not technological, that's sociological. Right. It's like the world's ready for it. It's like people are so fed up with the old paradigm that they have to move on from it. Like they're, they're like, this religious timeline makes no sense. We're not going to... Believe, we're going to throw it out, baby, with the bathwater and find something new. So it was like the world needed a new one. So then there's two types of metaphysical revolutions. The first is a technological one, where something happens that it is undeniable that somebody's metaphysics allows them to do something that is completely unexpected and breaks every single paradigm and everybody else tries to test it and they come to the conclusion that like, okay, I guess the way that they're thinking about this is correct. Like, I imagine Levin... That's a good historical example. Okay, Levin would be... Like, Levin is two-headed worms. Yeah. 
Well, he so, kind like, of... If he could regenerate an arm or something, he'd really win people over. He would. But with Levin, it's like, okay, so there's he's discovered something about the bioelectric communication inside of organisms that causes massive morphological changes. And he's able to go out into the world and look at something like insect galls on leaves and be like, look, there's clearly some insane biological program that can be activated that is uh that that shows that each organism obscures within it a much larger morphological potential than we think it has. Organisms can be weird stuff that they generally aren't. <laughs> Thank you. Right? They get stung by a wasp and they start growing weird structures like, that don't aren't really like weird there's somewhere pro there's somewhere interacting between the DNA, the code of the organism and the code of the other organism. Hybrid organisms are another interesting example. Yeah, exactly. So okay. So like that that's that's philosophy. Or like in if action. I if one of us, you know, banging on about material physics all the time could actually manipulate the medium of light and gravity. Like, if you could make shit levitate. Right. Then people would be... And I'd be like, here's how I did it, by manipulating the medium <laughs> of light and gravity, right? So, and you could explain that in terms of its material characteristics. And you're like, and, this is a box, and this is how the physics of the box work, and look, you can build your own box, and it, it works. And, and all your equations work, too, don't worry. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So, that's one kind, the technological. And the other kind is that people just realize that something has to shift because the stink of incompatibilities and logical fallacies just gets to be so strong that everybody's looking for something new and whatever first best theory arrives is the one that gets taken up so i feel like yeah so i feel like astrophysics planetary science is on the verge of a lot of these actually planetary science is much easier because it's gone through i believe it's much closer, right? They're looking at new planetary systems for the first time. And most of the last hundred years was based on studying our solar system alone. Now they're seeing planets, they see these different disks that they can attribute to planetary formation, like they have a lot more evidence, and so they have to update their paradigms. So mm-hmm. Cosmology, on the other hand, suffering from tremendous internal contradiction at the moment with this new James Webb data, amongst other things, the Hubble tension, problems with galactic rotation, dark matter, dark energy. There's just this real, real nasty accumulation of contradictions. Like literally, I don't want to say the exact percent, something like 94% of the universe has to be made up of magic, essentially. Like that's a, li- that's a little uncomfortable for anybody who starts to realize it. I mean, I think that... It's 94, 96% is like dark matter and dark energy. And then like baryonic matter is like 4% of the visible universe. I think you're you're spot on about that. It, it might not be incidental that the people that have been most difficult to talk to on the program have been cosmologists. Who have we talked to as a cosmologist? I guess uh, Ethan Siegel, mm, Stuart yeah. Finkelstein, uh, Brian Keating. He was. Uh, we talked to him about the James Webb redshift anomalies. Oh, at day. Texas. Yeah, he was at Austin. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, he's more of an astronomer, though. He was really big on dark. We asked him what he was moving into, and he was like, he really wanted to study dark matter. So he was like, way into it. And so I just those conversations have been the most difficult ones because I think that those people are most uncomfortable with the way that it's unfolding right now because they're the representatives of the theory that's kind of accumulating internal contradictions i think is the way to put it most politely (laughs) exactly and so it's been very difficult to have people on who are cosmologists who are open to seeing things in a different way because it seems very rigid there's a very rigid story there that needs to be maintained at all costs yeah it's very it's very orthodox uh, Rajendra Gupta is coming back, right? We have him coming up. He he wrote something about dark matter not being a thing or black holes not being a thing. What was that? Paper? I think he just got some press. I mean, he's writing about the same topics that he talked about the first time. He's trying to <laughs> he's trying to adjust the Big Bang narrative with a different timeline so that the James Webb data fits. Mm. And considering other mechanisms for the Hubble redshift business, other than expansion of space alone. He does still keep expansion of space. He's just like, well, maybe there's these other like tired light processes that people were talking about in the 70s and 80s that we should think about a little differently. And if we apply 
a, a weak version of those, we might be able to rescue ourselves from. We might be able to save the Big Bang story. Which and people I'm, are like, and everybody's like, well, maybe we should listen. Like all the people who love, who are like, in, you know, orthodox Big Bangers. Half of them, well, half of them are like that guy's crazy, and half of them are like, wait, 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 like, like we do need to save this yeah, stuff. Yeah, like yeah. it's it's becoming urgent, yeah. and so. I think that that's how these things will go is just discovery after discovery and generation after generation coming up into it and just being like, guys, like we need something different. And like we talked to OCs, like we talked to other people and they're like, this whole Big Bang paradigm is just not the right road. They're pretty far outside of the domains of academic power, though. There's yeah. almost nobody inside of Yale, MIT, Harvard, uh, Oxford, UCL. They're all working inside of the Lambda CDM thing. There's n- yeah, there's nobody that's up there that isn't. That's, that makes sense, though, because that's what the up there is funding, right? Is a monolithic paradigm. Which I think is where this becomes so frustrating. Because mm-hmm. you're like, that's a weird thing to have a monolithic paradigm about. It's, it's been forged over thousands, no, let's say hundreds of years. Maybe hundreds? thousands. I mean, we can trace this back e- most easily to Descartes and Newton. But maybe maybe it goes direct. further and further. Can you directly connect that? Well. <laughs> it's the favorite beginning to any sentence. I mean, there's two roads to approach this, so let's hold on to Descartes and Newton for a second, but... The Big Bang cosmology is congruence on its face with the cosmic egg s- motif, which is found across numerous indigenous and different ethnic and geographical cultures for thousands and thousands of years. This idea that there's a beginning of the universe, it's, the universe kind of hatches. I mean, everybody, you got to think for most of human history, everybody was looking up above them and saw a dome over their head, right? Mm. So this place is basic, and there's all this stuff swirling around. Like, we seem to be at the center of this egg. It must have hatched at some point, essentially. Uh, it must be hatching, actually. And so existence is sort of the hatching of the egg. And I think that's like a really... It's, a, it's really reassuring because it's really congruent with your own lived experience, right? You sort of hatch into the world mm. <laughs> and so much as we're dinosaurs. Uh, but no, we all come from eggs, actually, technically. It's true. So you're, you're born into the world. You have a life. You die. It's sort of either a heat death or, or a cold death, right? You either get old and die or you die violently or by, by some terrible disease. Like There's this fiery end for everybody and there's this origin point and i think that when lamatra wrangled einstein and hubble's work into a mythos that was scientifically congruent in so much as relativity and redshift astronomy was science that he gave a very comforting narrative to those anomalous pieces of data Right? The relativism was very hard for people to comprehend outside of mathematics. The s- f- scientific physical community wanted to sell it to the public. At the same time, Hubble's anomalous redshift data made no sense to anybody. Right, Things that are far away have these enormous redshifts. They can't possibly be moving away that fast, right? And so when... The Einstein's equations essentially result uh, in, well, either a crunch where everything does gravitates towards its, each other, but he has to insert this cosmological constant so it doesn't. And then Hubble comes along and he's like, wait, 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 wait. Well, it wasn't Hubble per se, but let's say someone brings the Hubble data, like Lamatra, and it's like, hey, 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 if everything's just blowing apart, then it explains why gravity isn't crunching everything together and and we can deal with the Hubble relationship at the same time. Great. And it's congruent with like some of the oldest mythological storytellings of our place in the universe that have ever existed. It's just a wonderful sort of story that everybody can get behind. So I think that that is why we have so much institutional faith in this doctrine. For which, yeah, you can work at Yale and MIT and you can tack little pieces on this story as long as you're adorning the story because it's like the mythological story of our times, of, of our humanity, of who we are, of who this whole existence and universe is. 
it's very self-reflective and congruent with our own lived experiences. So I think the only people capable of having a different story are going to be people from other cultures, so to speak. Because there are other cultures too, right, throughout history. So you're basically, you're making this case about the fact that everybody right. who works inside of these academies is required to work on adorning a central narrative that is very similar to the cosmic egg motif that has been central to all kinds of cultures and worldviews for thousands of years of history. And the only people that can come up with a different perspective, a different perspective are ones that come from some kind of other background. And in this case, do you mean like cultural background or do you mean, uh, I mean, I guess they're all cultural backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, that's mean... what's interesting about it is I feel like there have been other motifs for cosmology across the ages. Like there's been cyclic cosmologies in India. This is like a good contrast. Um, there's been ones where the material swirl together, like the Sumerian tradition, you have like the swirling kind of of chaos and order. You have this story of like the salt water and the fresh water mingling and these deities being born from it who eventually give rise to humans. But I feel like the, the central one over the last couple thousands of years has been this Judeo-Christian tradition of this inception of the universe and this this birth of the universe this is like a very western way of looking at it but but what i was going to say is that there's other people right so you look at a seas i just feel like people outside of that cultural institutional tradition are going to be the only ones capable of critiquing it i mean that kind of goes without saying right yeah i guess that's all i'm saying is that you have someone like a seas although hoyle was like this before him um and others uh, who else have we had on the show who's critical of the big bang like Every once in a while you encounter a physicist who's just like, you know, I'm not buying it. It makes more sense for things to have just been here always and for things to be going on forever. I mean, honestly, like Aziz and Unzikr, but we don't have a lot of other ones of those. I don't know if Unzikr is like on board with, with, with the this. eternal universe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, that's that's not necessarily, it's not that important to the point that you're making, I think. I agree that there are... What, my sound comes up my nose. I agree that there are physicists who see it in a different way. And I agree that those are not the physicists that are writing the papers in nature. I just think there's obviously no place for you at Yale or MIT to write a paper about an eternal universe. Like, what grant do you write that on to? What conference do you present that at? What... How do you articulate it, right? Because I feel like the institutional knowledge is this articulation process where what you do is you look at what came before you and you tack something onto it. Like that's literally what doing a PhD is, right? Or doing a master's thesis, like you do a literature review and then you talk about how you could advance the literature review. It's never just like do a literature review and then just like wipe it off the table and be like, and all of this was metaphysically mistaken. I mean, I think that there are reviews that would have to go back to the last place where people were talking about mediators and materials and uh, an infinite universe. And ah, so this takes us back to Descartes and Newton. Yeah, which I think that we've been like circling around for, for months now. But it's this idea that do you have stuff or do you have math? And there is a rich tradition of people saying that you have stuff. It's just a tradition that only appears periodically for a brief moment and then gets swallowed up by the magic. Because the magic is inherently more satisfying. People need magic. And they had gods and demons and, you know, magical sky spirits. And that was really satisfying. And you can't just take that away from people. Just be like, we're rational now. Well, yeah, that's what's really... So this is interesting because tomorrow morning we're going to have a conversation with Michael Hughes about some of this Western esotericism. And the question comes down to whether rationalism and yeah, materials crashing into each other is the best tool for understanding what's happening on the planet at all times. And I don't think that it is, really, is the fact of the matter. And that but that's of, really disturbing to me, too, at the same time, because I have to be very careful because I expect the physics to conform to physical material interactions. But I don't expect my interactions in the world to necessarily. 
And I think maybe this can be where we pick up after we talk to Michael, because we have to record a couple more of these. But I think that what we're circling around is that the materialist system of belief, where the only thing that there is, is chemicals bumping up against each other, or atoms bumping up against each other. And that is the limit to what you can use to describe the universe. And that is actually enough to describe the universe, necessary and sufficient. That's a limited perspective. but as And that's where you're trying to fix problems in your life with chemicals or with, you know, t technologies, as like physical technologies, as opposed to trying to change things about your life or something, or the way that you interact with people or the way you behave, all these metaphysical... Uh, I keep wanting to use the word metaphysical for those things. But let's say... They're not supernatural. Not like, behaving so. yourself isn't supernatural. It kind of is. Like, what does it mean to behave yourself, right? You have something that's it's outside not of yourself. I'd say it's not physical, whatever it is. It's conceptual. It's relational. Yeah, I'll take relational. But I just, I think that this is the central battle that each person has to fight for themselves. Like, how is it that you see the world fitting together? What do you think is your obligation to making sense of the world? How do you make sense of the world? Where do you allow the magic to live? And I don't think that there is a hard and set collection of rules that tells you the way that you should live the world. But I think that we are in this podcast on a quest to figure out something that makes sense. And there's no way for us to really do that without struggling with this question of dualism versus non-dualism eventually, which I think we're kind of, this is I why we started. that's why those were such frustrating conversations, like sometimes for some people, some people who are listening, right? It's because mm. we're like asking the questions, how does this make sense? And the people, the non-dualist fans are like, stop trying to make sense. And sometimes you run into that with quantum physics too. Or I did, especially in college when I was taking quantum physics classes. It was like, shut up, stop trying to make sense of things. But that's what's frustrating is because it, I don't think that immaterial interactions don't make sense. Right. And so that's where I would always get stuck on those conversations because I'm like, well, hold on a second. Like, yeah, it doesn't have to necessarily be physical, but it still has to make sense. There, There's cause and effect even if you don't have atoms crashing into each other directly that's causing that. And so... And the strong version of the non-dualism, like Jim Newman, is like, there is no... It doesn't matter, essentially, as far as I can tell. It's true, but that's an... I mean, that's an that's a performance art piece. Particularly radical... It's a radical performance art piece, which I respect. But he illustrates the like the the eventuality of that sort of philosophy. The the eventual end point, if you pursue it to its farthest degree. Yeah, sure. But I don't think that Jim Newman really lives that way. Like he said to us even, I don't talk to my friends about this. This isn't a thing that prevents me from living. And I'm like, I think that if you really were fully committed to it, it actually would prevent you from living. Because you have to have separation from the stuff around you in order to move. Like... You you cannot just root yourself to the tree or to the bush or to the grass and just be like, I am one with it. You'll just perish. It's actually really disturbing. Like I had this, uh, I was kind of a little bit exploring this sort of philosophy when I was younger and I was backpacking around and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when I was traveling after college and like trying to just play music across the across America and stuff. And I would spend a lot of time like with homeless people. And like, because there's a lot of people traveling, right? And most of them, not most of them, but a lot of them are ch like pretty disturbed people, right? They're in a bad spot, right? They're addicted to drugs, whatever. Mm. And I, I was very much at the time, like, I don't know if it was because I was outside of society a little bit, but it was easier for me to see us all as part of the same project like all of us being humans we're all kind of the same thing we're all having very similar experiences you know some are harder than others but mm. we all have pain you know i felt this like real identity with people and it really hurt like it hurt me to hang out with people almost mm. because i was so open to them being part of me almost that i had to listen to everybody's pain almost and experience it like sympathetically and so I guess like what is interesting is like as a result of that, I had to sort of cool myself off from it. Like I, I feel like I had to harden myself a little bit mm. so that I wouldn't take in people's experiences so intensely and be so sensitive to other people's pain. That's really fascinating. I know I had a point in telling this story. The separation is necessary in order to be able to ah, move through the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and things making sense was like a, a logical 
ramification of that was that by making sense of things is actually a little bit of a cold approach to reality, right? But I like it because it's safe. Like it, it, it gives me comfort to make sense of things, right? And but that's how I think I got into this science thing at the end of the day. And I guess I'm into the science thing in terms of forcing the materials to make sense, but also realizing that the relational uh, spookier stuff also does make sense. Things follow in a very logical way. They just don't obey the rules of physics. They still obey the rules of logic. Like logic is it, there's logic is the study of cause and effect. If you have a sufficiently complex collection of causes, then you'll get to your effect. And that holds for emotional stuff as much as it holds for physical stuff. And it really cools off emotional situations too, right? Like if you have to stop and make sense of things, you're not just in the chaos of the moment, right? I feel like a lot of this is about chaos versus order. Like making sense is an ordering process. It's, a, it's how you take all of this information that would just be overwhelming otherwise and put it in line so you can tell a story out of it that holds together. And it's when you do that with your emotional experiences, with like, say your r relational experiences with other people, with the world, you're also ordering it and cooling it off and it's not such a hot-headed experience. I guess that's, that's the attraction of making sense of reality to me. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you can understand cause and effect, the world is less painful. Because at least things aren't, things aren't just falling on you from the sky, right? It's like, there is reason for this. And I think that this is why we're so frustrated by the strange metaphysics of an immaterial quantum world somehow creating the material world in which we live. Because it's like, look, every single one of us then has to be comfortable with the fact that something at the core of reality doesn't make sense. And that's a weird fracture to live with. And I don't think it's very good for people because if people live with a sense of there's something that does not make sense at the center of reality, then all kinds of just, I don't want to say corrupted thinking, but disordered thinking follows from it. Because you accept agree. at the heart of your soul that it's like, well, sometimes things just don't make sense. And I'm like, no, 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 no. They always make sense. You just need to figure out how it is that they fit together. There's this, other, there's this other aspect that I feel like it, it enables this other philosophy, which is that um, like when you don't have to make sense of things, you can blame them easily on the external universe. Sometimes. I mean, I think that sometimes it's also possible to just make sense of something and be like, it came from, ex it came from outside. You can rationalize things to the external universe, too. Sometimes they do come from the external universe. Like, if somebody hits you in their car, it's like, and you were just stopped at a stop sign. It's like, there's not a larger ca spiritual cause for the fact that you deserve to get T-boned or something, but it, that there is a cause for that. And it's external. I guess, like, my experience is, like, interacting with a lot of, like, schizophrenic people and so forth back, like, in those times was that the cause that they ascribe to, th like, you can have a conversation with somebody who's, like, really mentally disturbed on the street. And they, they start off making sense, right? Mm -hmm. you're having, you think you're having a conversation with, like, a normal person. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden they start ascribing cause to things that don't make sense and then sure. they keep compounding and building on it. Right. And you can get really far down their rabbit hole because it, like, hangs together like a story, but it's like completely removed from their agency at some point. Yeah, and so it's like you, I think that you have to trust someone in order to be able to listen to their story. You have to trust that the, the rules by which they assemble the various pieces of reality are robust. And that's what's crazy about the Big Bang story or about the quantum physical story is that the rules, the logic, the math is unassailable in some sense. Like, you can pick fights with individual pieces of mathematical reasoning, but for the most part, the logic holds up. It's really the assumptions that underpin it that are where the problems begin. The metaphysics. So the assumptions are the metaphysics. Is that the full wrap on this concept? The assumptions are the metaphysics. I see. Okay, I like that. And the word meta means sort of beyond. So beyond the physics are the assumptions that go into the physics. Absolutely. I like that. Um...
it's going to be hard for me to adapt that, but I get it. I like it. I mean, you don't have to necessarily adapt it. It's just like, I'm glad that you finally get what I'm always banging on about. Because I feel like I'm just like multiple times a day, I'm like, it's the metaphysics, man. The assumptions that underpin it. And so the assumptions of MIT cosmology, I don't know, does MIT even have a cosmology department? Probably not. Standard cosmology. S- yes, yeah, standard, co- but the institutional cosmology or institutional physics mm-hmm. are ones that permit certain assumptions of magic, essentially. It's like, give me a miracle here and there and I can explain everything to you. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so there's, you're going to have to have a metaphysics from outside of that, which is in order to resolve those issues, it seems like we should be looking for a completely different metaphysics, which what it's going to have to have other assumptions too, which are probably equally perplexing. Right. Like when I talk about the alternative to the creation of the universe, the alternative is eternity. But that seems equally magical to a lot of people. What do you mean that time's been going forever and will go forever? Yeah. That's equally perplexing to some people. But it's an assumption. It's a metaphysical assumption. Or what do you mean uh, there's materials all the way down? And that's kind of what I'm just trying to say, is that I don't, I don't think that there is a metaphysics that comes without assumptions. Well, they are assumptions by definition, we just said. Yeah, right. So the, so, the question is whether assumptions are supernatural or not. It's, it's it's whether or not the assumptions are supernatural or, honestly, I have a really simple perspective on this. At the end of the day, it's what assumptions do you like? And I know that you hate that. I know that you're like, no, they have to make sense. And I'm like, I, I, I don't have such hard line perspective on it. I'm just, people make up worldviews on the basis of what they like. And some people really like magic and some people really like materialism. And it's like, those things are not one better than the other. I mean, you can argue that one's better than the other, but I'm kind of, I like to position myself on the outside of these things and Mm. be the observer. I'm like the commentator with the microphone, like watching it all happen, as opposed to being the person who's in the fray throwing punches. I always get super irritated when like I'm listening to a podcaster that I like and they don't stand up for something that they believe in. I'm an I'm an analyst. I believe yeah. in looking at the world and understanding it. I'm like, come on, man, get in there. What are you doing? They're just sitting back like, hmm. hmm. I definitely I mean I respect it. It's very journalistic versus editorial. Like they're two departments of the newspaper. I get it. I just see myself as a an anthropologist of ideas and so i have an anthropologist don't anthropologists study anthropods <laughs> uh, they study culture right anthropology is the study of human culture and so i guess i see myself as an anthropologist of science is that what it is yeah huh i just thought it was just of people well, cult- don't well, they look well, at like pe- artif- oh, they look at like bones and stuff too right those are archaeologists anthropologists they work with the archaeologists sometimes guy, like we've, everybody who's been an archaeologist on the show I feel like is also an anthropologist to some degree but I think that anthropologists are classically like the people that would go and be embedded with tribes and learn their language and like study their words and see how the way that the language worked changed the culture and see how like people operated within the culture and like the roles of men and women and children and like what they accomplished and how they thought about nature and so I guess I see that as being my position in the world of science where I'm really just studying how these ideas fit together and so I have tons of ideas about the philosophy of science i have tons of ideas about what a, what you can accomplish with a certain worldview and what you're limited by in other worldviews but i'm not in there with with a you know knights templar shield uh campaigning for some worldview that i'm like this is the right one and i'm just like god isn't this fascinating isn't this a crazy, crazy world that we live in where people have these divisions and these divisions structure everything that we know and think and they're hidden? But at the beginning of this conversation, I think that you agreed with my point that having improper metaphysics might hold you back technologically. But that might be by the end of the world just because you're held back technologically. Either. That's kind of what I mean. I'm like, yeah, maybe we can't make anti-gravity ships. And I'm like... Maybe that's, who needs them? I, it's not even who needs them. I'm just kind of like, we'll do other cool stuff. Like, it, it's just, I'm kind like of like... Anti-gravity boats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, like, I don't have a teleological outcome where I'm like, this is the arc that humanity must follow. I'm like... Bird suits. 
<laughs> that would be cool. I would buy a bird suit. Rocket pack. Fly around. That would be fantastic. But I'm just kind of like, I'm just kind of like, God, we're on such a weird ride, and it's gonna go how it's gonna go. I mean, I I, I feel you that I feel you about the fighting is gets a little bit in the way. I spend so much of my time fighting. I'm just kind of done fighting. I don't really like to fight. People love to fight. It's interesting. They really like to take up a position that's orthogonal to another position. I think it allows them to understand their own position better by having an enemy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that you have to have like a, a, a pivot point that you can push against in order to really understand your own range of motion and the various positions that you can take. And having somebody who has a different opinion allows you to set yourself on that course much more clearly as opposed to just kind of wandering through the world and like trying things on and not having anybody tell you that you're stupid. I guess what's weird about this in terms of my own path with physics is that, and I think this happens with people who join any ideology is that you feel so alienated by some common ideology that you're, you know, surrounded in drowning in. let's say like it doesn't, things don't make sense. Right. I read the I read the pop sci physics books. And I'm like, this is unsatisfying. Like, it doesn't make sense. I don't think that this is working for me. But I kind of like being on the side of, on the outside. Like, that's always where I've really enjoyed being. I've but always... then you say you find people who are like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, and, and it's you're like, like cool. oh, and they're like, we're materialists. I've never heard anybody say. That. Yeah, I know. No one would ever. Like, say I think that, that, that the like the new atheists were maybe the closest that we came to materialists. Rationalists, let's say. And even the rationalists are like a little bit nuts. And a lot of the rationalists have converted to post-rationalism, which is basically that it's like, yeah, there's all these probabilities, but there's also vibes. I guess like the best example, like I read Eric Lerner's book when I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa, this actually, I didn't know if it was right or not, but I was like, this at least makes sense. Right? Yeah. And there's definitely ideas that make more sense than others. Like I've never particularly loved quantum physics because of its discrete anti-sense making intense like I've always been kind of frustrated by it and I've always been frustrated in situations where people can't explain something to me like I've always had this sense where I'm like if you can't actually explain this and you're like you just have to trust it and like that's bullshit I've always been that and so I've always been suspicious of it but I guess my interest in it lies less in being like I'm going to show you how it is and more in the sense of I want to understand how it is that you came to believe this and how it's become so central and all of the ways in which it plays out culturally and historically and socially. More more journalists, less evangelists. Yeah, I'm just kind of like, Christ, there's enough evangelists I think I world. just had such an emotional experience coming up through this that I, I find myself more on the evangelical side of physics. <laughs> You've got a little preacher in you. Yeah, I was just, so many people <laughs> just told me that these questions were stupid for sure. so many years before I was, I don't know, old enough to stand up for myself and be like, actually, I don't think they are stupid questions. Yeah, exactly. And so I feel that. I, I, I respect that. So I just sometimes, I mean, it was really bad when we first started this podcast because I would just get very emotional, I feel like, a lot of times. I mean, I, I kept my shit together. But I don't know, like the, the Jacobo conversation, for instance, right? Sometimes like it, it rises up in me when someone's basically telling me that I'm just an idiot and I'm like, no, 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 that's not, like, I am maybe an idiot, but that's not what's happening here. I just get really fired up because I, I just have this deep history of that having happened. Like, going to my physics teachers, being like, I don't understand, this doesn't make sense. And people just being like, shut up and take another math class. Like, that's my experience. And it's just, I, I get that, that sort of wells up in me, which makes me very evangelical about rational physics at the end of the day. Yeah, I guess I've always just kind of, when I when I encounter stuff like that, I've always just been able to be like, well, if you can't explain it, you clearly don't understand it. And I understand that when someone is pushing so you. Well, no, I'm just I like I see in myself where somebody pushes me on something that I don't fully understand. And I know all of the social, psychological ways that I break under that pressure. I'll just answer a different question. I'll say, yeah, exactly. Or I'll just pretend like I didn't hear the question. <laughs> <laughs> just keep talking about something totally different. But yeah, so yeah. I try to see that and I try to be, I try to, I just, I'm so much more interested in, a, in an interaction with somebody where I understand the hilarious psychological fractures that are on display and I immediately forgive them for it and I'm able to just move past it. Rather than be like, you're breaking psychologically. Look at those fractures, man. Mm. 
it's just like, yeah, they're going to get even more upset and it's just going to be a catastrophe. And I'm like, maybe there's a different... Maybe there's a different path to follow that isn't so catastrophic. Because it's like, why? Why so, it, it why me, so catastrophic? This reminds me of this really funny paradigm in academic science where, like, I train myself at some point to when I give talks or something, if I don't know the answer to the question, I'll just be like, I don't know, I'm going to go, like, study about that. I'll email you. Like, let's talk later. Like, in lab meetings and stuff, for instance. Like, I don't know. That's a really good point. It's funny because they break you of that in your PhD defense mm -hmm. because the PhD defense, you're not actually allowed to say you don't know yeah. about something, right? I remember I had this one dude, I, should probably, I don't know if I should even tell this story, but why not? What are they going to do? I had this guy, I'm not going to say who it was, but from a different university who was grilling me because you have to have somebody on your committee from a different university, or at least you did back then. And he was grilling me on all these mathematical relationships. And essentially... I couldn't comprehend the questions he was asking because he's speaking a different language than me, essentially. He's coming at this from a totally different field of physics than me. And so I found myself in the position of not being able to say that I didn't know, right? Because this was dragging on too long and I just needed to move it on. So I did that thing, right? Where you sort of deflect it by like talking about a different subject instead. And I felt really bad about it at the time, but I was like, this is a completely forced situation that I would never be in in real life otherwise. Like, if we were at a conference together, I'd be like, look, man, we should talk about this after the conference at length. Like, let's go have some coffee. Let's see what's going on here. And I'm sure we can get to the bottom of this. And you can explain your language to me, and I'll explain mine to you, and we'll get on the same page. But it's just really funny to me how that, uh, how the examination actually, like, people feel examined, right? I mean, a generation ago, that exam might have been 12 hours. Right. And, so and you would have you would have been forced to in that moment go through it and really like and you deal don't want to have to it. examine people is what you're saying you're like as a journalist like I want to ask curious questions but I'm not going to like hold someone's foot, feet to the fire about how they're not making sense yeah because I think that it's it's laid bare like it's really you ask somebody a question a couple of different times and they've told you that they don't know and I'm like why would I embarrass you why would I, I this isn't life or death this is enough for me to see that you don't know. And everyone else can see that you don't know as well. And that's enough for me. And I know that you're going to have a really bad time if I put you on the spot and embarrass you and show that you don't know. And it's happened a couple of times. Like where we've, I remember uh, the conversation we had with Clarissa Yellow. It was a really good conversation, but I think that she left feeling put on the spot because we were kind of, we were grilling her about. Sharkova too. Right? Like we were grilling them about these things that they kind of knew, but they didn't have in easy recall. And it was embarrassing, and I think they felt stupid, and I'm just kind of like, it's just not, I don't think that it helps. I don't think it makes anything more clear, because I'm like, oh, obviously you're not the person who can answer this question for me, because my goal is to get the question answered. My goal is not to show that you don't know the answer to the question. Yeah, that's kind of bad faith, I suppose, like... I'm like, obviously, you don't know the answer to the question. Nobody knows the answer to the question except for maybe, like, two or three people. Mm. And I was checking to see if you knew, mm. right? Because we were grilling her on, like, how did they do the, like, the stern gerlach experiments where they knew that the electron was uh, quantized versus, or, like, that superposition was, was this, like, uh, it wasn't a mixing of states. It was, like, a specific, uh, like, discrete new state. And, like, she didn't remember the specific experiment or how they constructed it well enough for us to be able to come to any conclusion. And I'm like, you're just not the right person to ask about this. Somebody will be. And that'll be a really cool conversation. Yeah, the only reason that Jacoba went off the rails, I think, is because she was like, you don't know anything about black bodies. And I believe that you responded with, no, you don't know anything <laughs> about black bodies. <laughs> I don't think it was quite like that. I believe we got that part of the conversation off. <sighs> The same face for everyone. <clears throat> no, she told me to get the idea of the gaseous sun out of my or get the idea of the uh, something out of my head. I forget what it was. I that know. doesn't make sense. Anyways, the, uh, the surface of the sun. Yeah, the surface. Yeah. Maybe that's what it was. Like you get that out of your head. Get that out of your head. You're like, why don't you get it out of your Why'd head? You get the gaseous sun out of your head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wonder why the conversation went south. That's so weird. It's but. interesting because I was like, at the end, like, I think by the end of that, I was like, just send me, like, just show me some place where somebody on earth has measured a black body from a gas. Just one thing. And she sent me all these papers afterwards that were like these theoretical mathematical computations 
of how you could get a black body out of a gas. And that's what I mean. It's like everybody there knows what happened. And I'm kind of comfortable with just letting it lie and hoping that there's some other path to making sense of it. And I think that there is. And so where I'm like, I think people have screwy metaphysics and I think that it causes them a lot of pain in the world. And I think that it probably does really put a damper on discovery because we've gotten into a condition where we're monotheistic in our metaphysics. And we're like, you can only have these metaphysics about science. Anything else is not allowed. And I'm like, that's kind of screwed up. But I don't think I'm going to convince people of that by just browbeating them into, into submission. Like, I really believe that they have to fall in love with the idea that there's a better way of doing it. You want to put a bow on this? No, I think that's, that's a good place to end. I don't know, good cop, bad cop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. All right. All right, so we don't have to talk about physics ever again. We've wrapped up everything from the last year. Absolutely. We, put, we summed it all up. So I think... We're going to do a few more of these conversations because we're on the road and we need to. Well, it's, it's difficult to record Zoom conversations when you're on the road. So. And we haven't done a lot of reflecting. I think that this is a project where we spend a lot of time doing. And we have all these conversations about what we learn while recording the podcast, what we learn in the stuff that we're reading outside of the podcast. And people who come to the patron chats get a lot of access to it, but everybody else doesn't. And so this is kind of an opportunity to show another side of the podcast because we spend all our time in these sorts of conversations anyways. Yeah. Like, I guess this it's is worth a Saturday pointing afternoon. Out. This, is, <laughs> <laughs> this is just what we do. So we thought we'd share some of the, yeah, we're pretty much podcasting with ourselves 100% of the time otherwise. Yeah. All right. So next time we'll explore some of the other guests and recap on this year mm. and see how we can tie that into conversations that we're going to be having in the future. Yeah, I guess. Yeah.